By 2,000 years before Christ, trade was plying coastal waters, and soon seaborne trade routes covered the waterways of the known world. A canal joined the Red Sea to the Nile. The east was open to Mediterranean civilization. During medieval times, trade forced the expansion of these routes in the north to Iceland and the strange land to which fate had given a strategic position on the world's great oceans. The Pacific had not yet been christened nor conquered by the Europeans. Throughout the age of great discovery, the trade routes multiplied. Columbus sailed west to find not the East Indies and fortune, but a new world. Magellan navigated toward the unknown to find oceans, continents, islands, and finally death in the Pacific. The Pacific, where Captain Cook and other daring enterprisers opened the island empires of the East to world commerce. Today, these sea lanes which bind the nations of the world together are absolutely essential to world trade. The shock waves from the trouble at Suez, which closed the canal in 1956, were felt in every capital of the world. When the world is at peace, free commerce on these routes is essential to the welfare of the United States and to all the nations of the world. In World Wars I and II, the control of these sea lanes meant ultimate victory. If the world is again plunged into war, the victor must win control of these trade routes and deny their use to the enemy. Positioned along these sea lanes are continental coastal points and island groups in areas of shipping concentrations or in areas of strategic significance. To ensure the freedom of the sea lanes and to protect the world's commerce, these positions must be controlled by friendly nations. It is an axiom of modern logistics that there is no practical substitute for ocean-borne commerce. The cargo ship provides the most economical and most efficient method of transportation existent today or in the foreseeable future. In war, the United States depends upon these ships to carry out the massive support of our land, sea, and air forces, which take the battle to the enemy and away from our own shores. In a world constantly pushed to the brink of war by the aggressions of communism, the United States Navy stands prepared to protect our sea lanes and to support the forces of the free world. The communist drive for world domination starts with the domination of the individual. Once the individual has been indoctrinated to believe that he is nothing and the state is all, the state can easily usurp his rights and his freedom to achieve the goal of the state, the promised millennium when all men will be equal in their slavery. This promised day of brotherhood is to be gained by intrigue and finally by war and world revolution. While advancing toward this revolution, the communists have imposed the dictatorship of the elite of the Communist Party on some 900 million people. The communists preach a doctrine of mutual coexistence when they feel this will weaken the free world, while behind the Kremlin's walls they plan a world conquest by means short of war where possible, by limited or even general war when necessary. On the world propaganda stage, the communists dance to the spirit of Geneva and hold up the olive branch of peace. They make token reductions in the size of their massive conventional ground forces. And behind the curtain, behind the honeyed speeches of peace, grow the weapons of war. Consider these facts. We know the Soviet Union has the largest standing army in the world. To dupe the world, they published a figure of only 2,150,000 men. 
The United States Army has 1,260,000 men. Red Air Power, with some 20,000 Soviet Air Army operational aircraft and 3,000 planes of the Naval Air Arm, ranks a close second in world air power. Since 1950, the Soviet Union's naval construction has steadily increased. It now rivals the naval power of the United States. Since 1950, the Soviet Union has built 200,000 tons of cruisers. We have built none. Since 1950, the Soviet Union has built nine times as much tonnage in destroyers as has the United States. Her construction of submarines has been six times greater than ours. This film will show some of the major naval weapons systems the United States will employ if red aggression compels us to fight a future war. To attack North America by air, an enemy must penetrate the North American continental defense system. The first radar barrier of this system is the distant early warning line, then the mid-Canada line, and finally the pine tree line. A small number of Texas Tower radar stations off the Atlantic coast give a measure of close warning protection to seaward. Early warning aircraft lend additional protection to the continental United States and our island possessions. To extend the early warning defense line to seaward and prevent an enemy sneak attack, the Navy is charged with the responsibility of maintaining radar ships in both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The Soviet Union's air armies are sure to have every fixed air base and ground installation in the free world pinpointed. War will bring coordinated Soviet attacks on three areas, East Asia, the European North Africa area, and across the North Pole to the North American continent to hit our industrial centers. When such attacks are launched, the United States fleets at sea, already in a high state of war readiness, will be our most effective reprisal and defense forces. To meet the Soviet threat, we launched the supercarrier Forrestal and then the Saratoga with a planned program of more to come. These are a new breed of fighting ship in the glorious tradition of the Navy's fast carriers which fought World War II and Korea. The Forrestal, a majestic fighting machine, symbolizes the power of the new Navy. Her vital statistics, first, tremendous speed for her size. Designed for modern carrier hit and run tactics, she will be a difficult target for any weapon the enemy has. Second, she's big and dangerous. She can launch and recover the fastest, the longest range, and the hardest hitting naval aircraft. Third, she can protect herself. She carries her own protection, missiles, fighter cover, and her own anti-submarine patrol planes. In a 24-hour period, the Forrestal can speed nearly 1,000 miles. She will be a difficult target to find, and with her defensive power, even more difficult to destroy. Out of her enormous hangar and from her huge flight deck, she can launch bombers and fighter bombers to strike thousands of miles against the enemy with conventional, atomic, or hydrogen bombs. The Forrestal class is now capable of launching the transonic Regulus I and soon we'll have the supersonic Regulus II offensive weapon system with a striking range of 1,200 miles. Carriers, the most versatile instruments of modern warfare, can control the undersea menace with shipboard anti-submarine 
and early warning patrol aircraft, while above, in a thousand mile circle around the ships, their combat air patrols control the air. All Navy carriers will soon replace their conventional anti-aircraft batteries with deadly accurate surface-to-air guided missiles. In future warfare, high-speed U.S. carriers will operate with guided missile cruisers like the Boston. The Boston's defensive system will have nearly a 100% kill probability against enemy aircraft or missiles. On the Boston class, the missile launchers are located aft, and the entire after section has been reconfigured for missile stowage. The gun mounts have been retained forward to give firepower against enemy shipping and coastal defenses. Here at the Navy's Bureau of Ships in Washington, naval designers are developing plans for the nuclear-powered guided missile light cruiser, which will operate with the fast carrier force. Another ship of the fast carrier force screen, the guided missile frigate, carries its missile launchers aft for use against attacking enemy planes and missiles. Carriers, their aircraft and missiles, with a screen of guided missile cruisers and frigates, are a potent answer to the enemy's airborne weapons threat. Soviet Union submarines will be met by new and more deadly anti-submarine tactics and weapons. But the red submarine threat must not be underestimated. The communists have created the largest submarine force in the world. The Soviet Navy now has over 400 first-class submarines threatening Allied deep water shipping and coastal traffic. In the event of war, the United States Navy has the responsibility of breaking the back of this submarine force at sea. We will destroy all accessible enemy submarines in their pens or before they can reach open water. If they should get to open water, enemy submarines on their way to convoy routes to our focal points for shipping and our important harbor approaches will be systematically hunted down and sunk. And finally, if they get through these defenses, our convoys and task forces will deal with them. The USS Nautilus was the world's first nuclear-powered ship. In 1956, she had already steamed over 50,000 miles without refueling. Add to this her nearly unlimited submerged endurance and greatly increased speed, and you will understand the revolution in naval concepts she has created. She can steam undetected into enemy waters, lie in wait for days, and destroy enemy submarines before they ever get to sea. These supersonic P-6Ms can lay mines in areas inaccessible to surface minecraft and carry out anti-submarine area and barrier patrols. As an almost independent offensive air attack system, the long-range seaplane and its partner, the seaplane tender, is receiving increased attention. These planes can be based on any reasonably sheltered body of water. They do not need a series of multi-million dollar airfields from which to conduct operations on a worldwide scale. Their tenders provide for refueling, servicing, and rearming in forward areas. Their runways are indestructible and, of course, have no maintenance problems. By steaming to a new area and anchoring, tenders provide new advanced bases. Replenishment may also be provided through rendezvous with aircraft or with submarines. The new anti-submarine warfare helicopter and carrier airborne hunter-killer teams are powerful partners in the vital job of destroying enemy submarines. Enemy submarines approaching our task forces 
will be detected and destroyed by force screens, aided by our submarines and patrol planes. Modern destroyers will be equipped for anti-submarine warfare with homing torpedoes, depth charges of vastly greater killing power and radius, and more lethal, a head-thrown weapon. New destroyer types incorporate guided missile launchers for surface-to-air warfare. The use of nuclear warfare demands the extensive deployment and dispersion of amphibious sea forces and their assault troops. And so another new ship has joined the fleet, the amphibious assault ship with its helicopters and embarked marines. From each of these transport carriers, a reinforced battalion landing team with all its airborne assault equipment is flown to strategic points behind the enemy coastal defense system. During the early phases of approach, gunfire preparation, and air bombardment, where these airlifted Marines regroup and organize, infiltrating selected areas, enveloping enemy forces, overrunning his positions, and linking up with the beach assault forces, moving inland to press home the united assault on all key points of the primary objective, consolidating the area for further exploitation and development, and establishing a strong defensive perimeter within which the continued troop and supply buildup may be expanded through use of the rehabilitated port and communications facilities increasingly available for this phase of operations. As the CBs and engineers clear away the obstacles and repair the docks. And so vertical envelopment of the enemy has been gained through the mobility and striking efficiency of the Navy's new assault weapons. We have seen the Navy's latest the newest concept of fighting future wars on the open seas. The Navy's job is to stop enemy attacks before they can be launched and punish and defeat him on the sea and in the air over the sea. The Soviet Navy has no aircraft carriers because the present phase of red global expansion does not call for massive overseas projection of military power by naval forces. The communist consolidation of the Eurasian heartland is now nearly complete. The next phase of the red power drive will be to overrun the remainder of Eurasia and conquer the African continent, thus destroying the oceanic coalition of free countries and isolating the Americas for future conquest. This present objective does not require Soviet control of the world's broad ocean area. This red power drive will be basically a ground air forces operation over continental land masses with strong naval support. It is based upon denying us the world sea lanes, especially of the strategic approaches to the Eurasian and African land masses. To divert the United States and allied power from these critical areas, the Soviet Union operating with Red China and the satellites may throw amphibious forces into battle in areas we cannot ignore. In Asia, the South Pacific, or wherever their manpower surplus, their minor shipping, and their land-based naval air arm can be effectively used. The Soviet Union's Navy must bear the major burden of supplying the communist forces by sea and defending them from our carrier and missile striking forces. Offensively, the great mobility of our carrier striking forces presents a series of difficult targets for the enemy to find and to attack. The communists cannot possibly score hits on all our naval striking forces, nor can they successfully stop our carriers from launching their strikes. These carrier striking forces standing off the coasts of Europe and Asia give us tremendous mobile striking power. 
carrier-based fighter bombers and missiles can reach hundreds of miles inland to most military targets on the Earth's surface as part of the joint United States Retaliatory Striking Forces. Regulus II launched from submarines can hit the same targets. To support our offensive carrier forces, nuclear-powered and guided missile submarines will move in to destroy surface and air installations threatening the fleet. In conclusion, we know that the Soviet Union's threat to world peace is a ruthless, long-range conspiracy. History faithfully records the fall of every nation which has become a threat to world peace. The world awaits this fall, and we wait. And we are forced to keep the United States Navy in a constant state of war readiness. The United States Navy is the most versatile weapon in freedom's arsenal. It has the unique power to apply just the proper force in the proper place to safeguard the free world. A diplomatic show of the flag. A demonstration in force to deter minor aggression. nuclear missile and bomber strikes if the Soviets attack comes.